deals with federal grant and agreements. And these are the basic rules for what your cost share have to be. So you could see they have to meet the one through seven there. So they have to be verifiable. You, they can't be used, it can't be matched for our award and another federal award somewhere else. Um, necessary and reasonable for the project to get accomplished. And uh, subpart E, there's allowability of costs. We'll talk about that later in subpart E of 2 CFR 200. They can't be, your matching funds that you uh, are able to come up with can't be paid by the federal government under another federal award. So unless it's specifically authorized, if you're getting federal funding from Bonneville Power or something, you can't use that as a match for NRCS. Next, there has to be in an approved budget, and we're gonna talk about assembling budgets and how you assemble a budget. Um, and when we have the budget, uh, that gets approved by our FPAC Grants and Agreements Division, GAD, and that is when you know you have a approved budget. So that is part of the process. We're trying to enable you to submit budgets that will pass that scrutiny. So that is that slide. So there's a, if you wanna, how do I value, like if I'm using my time or we're donating property, um, how do I, how does that get valued? Um, and that's in subpart E again of two CFR 200. Um, find that and you can look up any particular kind of cost, whether it's labor or property equipment, and you can see how it's valued so that when you're putting your budget together and you're formulating what your 50% match is gonna be, 25% of which can be in kind, that you're following the rules on allowability. The highlighted terms there show what we're looking for. Um, they have to be allowable under that subpart E and then reasonable. It has to be what the organization normally charges for its people and that type of thing. It can't be double normal rates. And they have to be allocable to your project and not just something that uh, maybe benefits all the activities of your entity, but instead is allocable to the CIG project. Thanks, Chris. And then also I wanna let you know that I'll go back a slide here that this is the link if you wanna look at the Code of Federal Regulations. This link is hot and then the links within this uh, slide are also hot if you wanna look at these, these parts. And like I say, I should have this uploaded this afternoon. Um, again, just wanna reiterate, uh, we plan on these projects starting about September 1st. Um, sometimes there's a holdup with grants and agreements. Um, Chris and uh, Adam work very hard to get these agreements out to you guys and signed if you're selected. And again, the maximal, maximum award amount in 2023 is $100,000. Um, also, just a reminder that payments to participants, you fall under the EQIP payment limitation, which is $450,000 for this farm bill, Farm Bill 2018, or the Ag Improvement Act of 2018. So something to think about if you've been working with us in the past and have had EQIP contracts. So any questions on that part? I don't see anything. And, and Chris and I are also available, you know, anytime if you need to get a hold of us, um, our contact information or Adams is on the, the very first slide there and it'll be on the very last slide. So let's move on to proposal submissions. You can find those application forms at grants.gov or on our NRCS website under applicants. There's a lot of good information there. Um, here's a list of what we're looking for from those proposal submissions. We're looking for the application package checklist, the SF-424, which we have a little information on that in a minute. You do have to um, have DUNS and SAM registration um, some budget information you have to fill out in there, project description, budget, a detailed budget narrative. That's one thing we do get dinged on a lot and it gets sent, sent back from grants and agreement. Declaration if you are a beginning farmer or rancher and then declaration of eligible equipped producers. And someone asked if OSU is eligible. Yes, we have had uh, CIGs with OSU before. So definitely OSU is eligible. 
So Chris, I'll turn this over to you for the 424, the application. Yeah, and I, this one I've partially filled out just to show how the boxes work because these forms are not altogether self-explanatory. So this will be posted and you'll be able to see that we've got the, um, that it's an application, it's new. And then on the next page, she's showing you uh, that we've already put the agency's name in in this catalog of federal domestic assistance number, uh, the program title, the funding opportunity. So if you start with this SF-424, you'll be part of the way there. All right, here's what we're looking for. This is the state uh, priority resource concerns we've selected for Oregon. Um, so if as you're doing your descriptions and your project proposals, please you know, note this is what we're looking for. Energy, air quality, and atmospheric change, which also translate to greenhouse, greenhouse gases, which you all know, Inflation Reduction Act, there's a lot of focus right now on greenhouse gases, water quality, water quantity, plant health and vigor, soil quality, wildlife habitat, and livestock. So we like to keep it pretty broad, but those are, those are our key points in Oregon that we're looking for. Um, in these proposals. And then we wanted to go over the project narrative a little bit when you submit these. Um, this is what basically the outline of what needs to be in those submissions. Um, so this will be in those slides for you to kind of look at too. And I think, Chris, do you, you talk about environmental impacts, cultural resources? Of course not. Okay, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking at, uh, we have to follow the NEPA um, process when we do these projects. It's pretty simple. We will take a look at it. If it is something that needs site visits or it's ground disturbing, uh, we'll use our archaeologists. I'm just moving down here to this NEPA part. Um, so we do require being able to review that with sometimes the State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO, um, but we will be in touch and definitely work through that process with you. It's not something we're gonna do behind your back or anything like that. We just wanna make you aware. Um, I've been doing this a year and then I've looked back on the past ones. We haven't done any site visits yet because everything is pretty much um, on the up and up pretty much non-ground disturbing, nothing like that. So just to be aware. Um, and again, here's the property review requirements. Um, again, we've mostly just done a review with SHPO and they come back and say, you're good to go. So just, just wanna give you guys a heads up on that part. Um, budget information. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Chris here with the budget narrative guidance. Yeah, and, and make sure, you know, in, that, in the SF-424, we, we want to emphasize that entities have to be registered in SAM.gov, um, and that is the system for award management for the government. That is because that is linked to your entity's bank account, and that is how, if you are successful and you get a grant agreement, that is how we pay you. So uh, without the SAM registration, we can't enter into an agreement. So make sure if your SAM registration, if you're already registered, um, that it's current and it's gonna be current through the period of your, pro your project. And if you're not yet in SAM registration, please do that so that you can be considered. Now the cost principles are all in 2 CFR 200 again. And again, we're looking at allowable, allocable and reasonable. And there are the links that describe those things so that as you are coming up with the costs and your budget, you wanna make sure that you're following the guidance that makes them allowable, allocable, and reasonable. There's also a budget narrative that gets done and these are the categories for your budget. And I need to make a point that for indirect costs, our appropriation limits not-for-profits and institutes of higher education to 10% indirect costs. So 90% of the grant money can, has to be a direct cost category, such as personnel, fringe, travel, equipment, supplies, contractual. And that would comprise the entire budget 
So if you were going for a full $100,000 of the federal maximum amount, and you were matching that with your own 100,000, you would have a $200,000 project and $20,000 if you're 10% indirect cost rate, leaving $190,000 to be direct costs that you would have to divide over the personnel, fringe, travel, equipment, and supplies. And then we'll show how you, later we'll show you how you uh, calculate those things and how you support your budget narrative. Um, what the, because it's a grant, they, our Granted Agreements Division is gonna carefully vet your budget and make sure that there's no uh, math errors and uh, that there's some, you've shown your work for how you arrived at your costs. Um, and we'll talk about how that's done later. And we have guidance on that uh, that explains how to do how to do your budget narrative and describe your costs in each of these categories we're looking at on the screen now. Yes, state funds can match. See that question. Now, there is a section on unauthorized costs that is pretty um, self-explanatory. It's at CFR 2. 2 CFR 200.420. And you will want to make sure you kind of look at that. You can go through selected items of cost there. And when you do that, it'll, you'll see things like, well, alcohol is not allowable. The cost of your lobbying is not allowable. But each of these sections, whether it's alcohol or alumni activities, audit services, bad debt, you can find out if that is an appropriate budget item just by going to those sections and clicking on the link and reading what's there. We also saw patents and inventions a minute ago. And I wanna talk about those for a second. Um, you retain your patentable uh, investment. If it, you, know, you are simply granting the government a royalty free license to use that technology as well. So you could still, it, it would be yours and uh, yours to sell and um, resell as you saw fit. It's just that you can't sell it to the federal government since we helped you develop the technology. So that's how patents and inventions work. We just get a free license to use it, but all of the intellectual property rights remain yours. Are there any restrictions related to capital costs? That's one of the questions, Chris. Yeah, capital equipment is typically not um, an allowable cost. And that is we take a piece of equipment that's over $5,000 and it becomes accountable property or capital property. And uh, yeah, those we're not really interested in using our money to um, buy applicants property for them or equipment. Excellent, thank you. We, we had uh, one rejected for that. We had, a, you know, uh, we've had it rejected for electric tractors before. Our grants and agreements division looked at that and they go, we're not buying that for them, you know. And they rejected that budget item. So yeah, no capital equipment. Perfect. Um, one other thing with your proposals, uh, please, please somewhere declare if you've had a previous national or state CIG with us before. Um, document that in your application. Let, let us know, please. Um, again, one more time, proposal submissions, Friday, May 8th, must be submitted electronically through grants.gov. Um, we don't accept fax, email, or post through the mail. So just want to make that very clear. That was um, something that really got me last year, had to remember. Questions on this section so far? Um, I don't know if OSU has reached the payment limitation. I will do some checking on that. Derek and get back to you on that. So the review process, let's go over that a little bit. We, we're looking at these um, a couple different levels here. So we're looking to see if they've been studied sufficiently, if you've got some research done, if you've got a good argument of why this is gonna work or you, you know it's going to work. We're looking that it demonstrates uh, environmental um, the environmental part of our, our um, request for proposals. Uh, we also want to encourage adop adoption by uh, you know, the state. Um, and then we wanna see if it introduces 
technology from another geographic area or ag sector there. So the way we review these is they, they come into us from grants.gov. We pull those out after the deadline. We send these out to the basins that they are in, let um, our local staff review those, probably a basin team leader, maybe a soil con, maybe the district conservation conservationist in the area that it was submitted from. Um, within we have a technical review. So people from our technical staff, uh, if it's a, a cropland sort of project, we'll let our agronomy department review that. Um, and then also, once we get the final recommendation from those people, we send this up to the executive staff and they review this. It's mostly the state conservation as he's looking at these. Um, and most of the time he's very aware of what's going on with these CIGs. So um, we're also looking for transferability, the, the potential that this could be adopted by NRCS as part of our day-to-day -day business. And so, you know, we're just looking for those projects that, that help us out in our daily, daily work. Um, successful applicants, you can go on the website, uh, the CIG website and look at, you know, projects we've already had, projects we've had in the past. And then we're looking for um, those ones that have a market-based approach, um, that can maybe move to an interim conservation practice that we could start using, try to use. And um, assessment management tools. We have a couple of those right now. Irrigation, is an irrigation management system to measure water better than we, than we have been or that we already are in certain areas. Unsuccessful applications. We're not looking for research projects. There's a whole list here. Um, it doesn't involve eligible producers. You don't have the match. These do get looked over pretty closely. So just, just make sure, um, you know, if it's already funded under another CIG, then we're probably not going to fund it. So um, just want to give you some examples there. For additional information, here is our contact information. Um, this will be in the slides I said, you know, it'll be uploaded. So you can check the website later today if, if you don't have time to write this down or anything. So any questions? That's our last slide, Chris. Um, anybody have any more questions? Um, recognizing that it can't be solely a research project, is it all right for the research to be a main component of the project? That can be, yes. So you're just showing uh, the how you came to the solution, is that what you're talking about? Just the research, um, trial and error sort of sort of thing, Evelyn? Um, the project that we're thinking about doing is, so we would be doing a variety of trials, but then there would be like an extension outreach education sort of component to the project as well. So we would be applying for the whole, um, both sort of some funding that would support the research and then also those like extension education outreach events. Okay. I mean, to me, that sounds like it fits within the parameters, definitely. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other, oh, does water quality, quantity, and compass projects related to groundwater? Uh, yes. We, I think we've had a project in that Hermiston area where they have all the groundwater issues. So definitely. Chris, you might be able to answer this one. Um, the request for proposals asks for a current and pending support form for each key personnel on the project and suggests using the template provided in the related documents tab of opportunity, but I can't find the template. Ooh, we, we don't have a template for the key personnel part, huh? Um, I'll look through, but I don't know. Um, I might have to go to national. They actually send us this request for a proposal and we fill in, <laughs> we fill in the dates and the times and uh, the Oregon part. So I will ask for that, Maggie, and try to get that back to you. Thank you. Um, I'm, I, we also do quite a bit of proposals to NIFA um, and they require statement of current and pending support forms. So if it's the same, form as what NIFA requires, um, 
that could also be fine as well. Um, we have we have those on hand. Okay, I would send that in with your with your proposal for sure. Okay, okay. thank you. You're welcome. Um, workshops are not funded, but can testing from stakeholders to develop a tool be funded? Um, I'm pretty sure we have a project like this, uh, what you're talking about, um, that we can, we can fund projects like that, yes. Any other questions? If not, um, I appreciate everybody joining today. Uh, it's short and sweet. Um, I know I recognize some names. So I know a lot of you have been through this process before. Um, and again, you have our, you'll have our contact information. Please don't hesitate to email me with questions and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. So thank you everybody for coming and we'll have this up on the website a little later today. Um, and we will talk to you all later. <laughs>